chapter 2 of 2 Samuel established David, God's man, as king over Judah, and he set up his headquarters in Hebron, but he had by no means consolidated his power over all of the clans that represented even the Hebrews in the south of King. And while much of Judah instantly accepted him as their monarch, the tribe of Simeon was also undoubtedly brought under David's sphere of influence, although Simeon isn't mentioned, and thus is kind of treated like an afterthought. Now, the tribe of Simeon was alive and well, but because, if you'll notice, their ter territory that came as a result of a curse upon them by their father Jacob, well, they were completely surrounded by Judah's territory, kind of like a bullseye in the middle of a target. And they had virtually no chance to establish themselves as a tribe of any consequence at all. So we're going to get only snippets of information about Simeon from time to time in, in, in the coming books because their significance as a viable independent tribe of Israel ebbed and flowed, but generally remained pretty precarious until sometime after Hezekiah when they more or less disappeared altogether. Now, it was not that some genocide had come upon them. Rather, a variety of circumstances caused them to slowly assimilate, mostly into Judah. It's just a matter of practicality. Many of Simeon hung on to their tribal heritage as a matter of family pride, but their allegiance and their livelihood was generally attached to Judah. Now, at the end of chapter 2, we saw a blood feud established between Avner, Abner, King Ishbosheth's military commander, and the de facto power of the Northern Tribal Coalition. And it was between him and Joab, Joab, King David's military commander, who was the son of David's sister, Zeruah. Now, Joab's younger brother, Asahel, was killed by Abner when, after an incident at a place called the Pool of Gibeon that lay on the, the border of Benjamin and Judah, Azahel chased Abner with intentions to end his life, but Abner came out the victor. Thus was established a family vendetta now against Abner. Now, I want us to pay special attention and to note that in this chapter, really in all the books, that are going to lay ahead of us, we will see a steady degradation, a steady corruption in how the Torah is applied in the national life of Israel and into the lives of individuals such as David. And this is why studying the Torah is so important in the first place. Because how can we recognize the corruption and the misapplication of something we don't know anything about? Even behind this blood feud between Abner and Joab, we see a, a twisted logic emerge that causes Joab to view his intentions of seeking revenge on Abner as a legal duty, maybe as even being pious before the Lord. And when we get to Abner's death at Joab's hand, we'll discuss this a little bit more extensively. But for now, just let me say that Joab takes on the role as his family's Boel Hadam, blood avenger, which within certain boundaries is sanctioned by Jehovah and the law of Moses. Now recall that six cities of refuge were ordained by the Lord. They were set up throughout Canaan so that people could escape to the nearest of these sanctuaries and be protected from the wrath of a, of a blood avenger who could legally kill this person who had caused the death of the avenger's family member. The other thing we need to take notice of is how the Lord uses the will of humans to achieve his will, even though we're not even aware of it. 
we really don't see the narrator of these chapters about David making it a regular point to say that the Lord caused this or the Lord caused that. Rather, we see men taking actions that on the surface appear to be totally independent and personally willful with the intent of fulfilling their own agendas. And yet, as all this unfolds, we see the divine master weaving these decisions and these actions of various men into a perfect fabric and advancing his purposes with the participants largely unaware. See, this is a mysterious biblical pattern we've seen since Genesis. We observed it in a dramatic fashion as the Lord used Pharaoh's stubborn heart that was thoroughly against God to achieve the deliverance and liberation of his people, Israel. And as I was reminded with, or rather reminded at dinner with some friends the other evening, this dynamic of God is really the most prevalent and operative manifestation of him in our lives, in the world today, just as it's always been. What routinely goes on daily in our lives, in the lives of those who govern us, in the lives of those who teach us, in all who we come into contact with, is in one way or another, this is all playing a role, an outcome that's predetermined, in a sense, by the Lord since eternity past. It's just invisible to us. Unless we occasionally pause to to look back. It's when we look back, we recognize it for what it is. And then when we do, we also kind of need to pause when we think about all this. And to give praise and honor and glory to him alone who could do such a thing. So let's read 2 Samuel chapter 3 together. Open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 3. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 336. Three thirty-six. Second Samuel chapter 3, we're going to read it all. It's a long chapter. The war between the house of Shaul and the house of David dragged on, but David grew stronger while the house of Saul became weaker. Sons were born to David, David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon, whose mother was Achinoam from Israel. His second, Elah, whose mother was Abigail, the widow from Nabal from Carmel. The third, Absalom, whose mother was Macha, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur, the fourth, Adonia, the son of Hagit, the fifth, Shephiah, Shef- the son of Abital, and the sixth, Yitriam, whose mother was Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. And during the war that was going on between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner strengthened his position in the house of Saul. Saul had a concubine named Ritzpah, the daughter of Ayah. And Ishbosheth challenged Abner, Why did you go, uh, go and sleep with my father's concubine? Well, these words of Ishbosheth enraged Abner. What am I? he shouted. That you would treat me with such contempt, a dog's head in Judah? Till this moment I have on, only shown kindness to the house of Saul, your father, and to his brothers and to his friends. I haven't handed you over to David. Yet you choose today to pick a fight with me over this woman. May God bring terrible curses on Abner and worse ones yet if I don't accomplish what Adonai swore to David to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and Judah. From Dan all the way to Beersheba. Ishbosheth couldn't answer Abner with a word because he was afraid of him. Abner immediately sent envoys to David with this message. Who is going to control the land? If you will make yourself my ally, I'll use my power to bring all of Israel over to you. And David sent this reply, very well, I will be your ally on one condition. 
You will not come into my presence unless at the same time you bring with you Michal, Shaul's daughter. And David sent messengers to say to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, Give me back my wife, Michal. I betrothed her to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, Haltiel, the son of Laish. Her husband went with her, crying as he went, and he followed her to Bacharim. But when Abner told him, Go back, he returned. Then Abner conferred with the leaders of Israel, and he said, In the past, you wanted David to be king over you, so now do it. For Adonai has said of David through my servant David, I'll rescue my people Israel from the power of the Philistines and from the power of all their enemies. And Abner also spoke with the people of Benjamin. And then Abner went to Hebron and he reported to David everything that had been agreed to by Israel and the house of Benjamin. And when Abner came to David in Hebron, he brought 20 men with him. David held a feast for Abner and his men. And Abner said to David, I must get up and go to gather all Israel to my lord the king so that they can make a covenant with you. Then you'll be able to rule over everything your heart desires. David sent Abner off, giving him safe conduct. And just then, David's men and Joab returned from a raid, bringing a lot of plunder with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron because he had sent him off under safe conduct. But when Joab and all his army arrived, Joab was told, Avner the son of Ner came to the king, but he sent him off and he's left here under safe conduct. And Joab went to the king and said, what have you done here? Here, Abner came to you and you sent him away. Now he's gone. Why? You know Abner, the son of Ner. He came only to deceive you, to learn what campaigns you're planning, to find out everything you're doing. And after leaving David, Joab sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the water cistern at Sirah without David's knowledge. And upon Abner's return to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the space between the outer and inner city gates as if to speak with him privately, and there he struck him in the groin so that he died, thus avenging the death of Asahel, his brother. And afterwards, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are forever innocent of the death of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it fall on the head of Joab and all his father's family. May Joab's family always have someone with a hemorrhage or a serrat or who has to walk with a cane, or who dies by the sword, or who lacks food. Thus Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner, because he had killed their brother, Asahel, during the battle in Gibeon. But David said to Joab and all those with him, Tear your clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourn over Abner. King David himself walked behind the body as it was carried, and they buried Abner at Hebron. The king wept out loud at Abner's grave, and all the people wept. The king sang his, this lament over Abner. Should Abner have died like a thug? Your hands weren't tied, your feet weren't fettered. You fell like one who falls at the hands of criminals. Then all the people wept over him more than ever. And all the people came to David and tried to make him eat some bread while it was still daytime. But David swore, may God bring terrible curses on me and worse ones yet if I even taste bread or anything else until the sun goes down. And all the people took note of this and it pleased them. Whatever the king did pleased all the people. So that day, all the people and all Israel understood that the king had had no part in the killing of Abner, the son of Ner. The king said to his servants, You realize that a leader, a great man, has fallen today in Israel. Even though I have just been anointed king, I feel weak today. And these men, these sons of Zeruah, are too brutal for me. May Adonai repay the criminal as his crime deserves. Well, verse 1 sets the stage. Many commentators are, will say that what verse 1 is describing is civil war. Well, that's a gross mis mischaracterization in my view. Indeed, there was an ongoing hostility between those loyal to David, those loyal to Ishbosheth, but generally speaking, there was no declared state of war whereby armies were pitted against armies in pitched battles, even the conflict between Abner's men and Joab's men at the Pool of Gibeon started kind of as an impulse, a, a rash, gladiator-like competition, as deadly as it was. It's just something that got quickly out of hand, not as enemies happening upon one another as they were on a seek-and-destroy mission. 
Now, a Cold War of sorts was underway between the North and the South. Certainly, skirmishes between the two sides happened, but they ought to be visualized more as uh, raids of one clan upon another clan with the purpose of stealing food and supplies and other valuable items from the other side. And people were killed. But this was a battle of wills for the hearts and the minds of the people, and it required an intimate knowledge of the culture and a heavy helping of finesse a lot more than military force. This is because there were unspoken limits on the actions that could be taken and just how wide or how permanent any kind of disaffection between the Israelite clans and the, and the tribes might be. I mean, after all, all Israelites shared a common family bond. And in the end, that had a lot to do with their flexibility to kill one another or pillage from each other one day and then be allies the next. That's the nature of tribalism. Let me see if I can give you an illustration of those circumstances in David's day by using a, something from our time. Notice how in the Middle and Far East our modern militaries are, well, forever stymied by these tribal armies. They don't have much technology. They use primitive strategies. They employ mostly basic armaments to fight with. Also notice how on the diplomatic side, we see this constant frustration, this bewilderment of our ambassadors and our, our high government officials who, even though they've been trained at our elite universities like Harvard and Princeton and Berkeley, they find themselves constantly outmaneuvered by these primitive tribal leaders who seem to change their loyalties at the drop of a hat. Everything's a moving target. It can morph from friend to foe and back to friend again with little more than the right words uttered in a meeting accompanied with a customary bribe. Or just as problematic, some sacred site is violated. Or some cultural customer or family's honor is stepped upon, none of which we even knew mattered. And boom, loyalties shift again. Westerners have little regard or respect and even less understanding for the centuries, centuries of history. Long-standing blood feuds, immutable cultural traditions, vague family ties. These are all the driving forces behind all of these decisions and actions. Thus, as our generals are discovering, there are limits as to what pure force can achieve. And the outcome's never going to be well-defined and neat, like we're World Wars I and II. Rather, what we are witnessing every day on our televisions is a never-ending process of jockeying for position. That's what tribal society is all about. And until tribalism is replaced with something else, nothing's going to change. Thus, we're told that as this War dragged on, the house of Saul diminished, and the house of David grew stronger. Now, this is speaking of relative strength, an ebb and a flow. This is no clear-cut victory. This is no permanent shift in power and control from one government to another government. What this means is that the clans were positioning themselves to side with the eventual winner. They needed to be allied with the current strongman, who at this time was Ishbosheth, but had to be ready to change over to the emerging one, David, in a heartbeat. And from an earthly standpoint, this so called war between David and Ishbosheth was not a contest between ideals and philosophies about ways of life. This was about prosperity and security and status. And the weak and ineffectual Ishbosheth couldn't measure up to what the charismatic and highly regarded King David had to offer. From a heavenly standpoint, the Lord was allowing men's evil inclinations 
personal desires to bring about his determination that David would become God's earthly representative over all of Israel, over God's earthly kingdom. Well, verse 2 starts to trace the establishment of David's house, meaning his family. And it's gone through a number of stages, beginning with his marriage to Michal, Saul's daughter, only to have her taken from David and then given to another man by a vengeful Saul. Later, during David's self-imposed exile from Canaan, because Saul was trying to kill him, David married the widow of a fellow named Nabal, who was Abigail, also married another woman named Ahinoam of Jezreel. Now that David is king, and he's taken up residence back in Judah at Hebron, it's time to assemble a royal harem. Thus, all of these sons we see mentioned from these various women are born in Hebron, David's capital city. Now, the preeminent son was Amnon, his firstborn, whose mother was Ahinoam. Amnon means faithful. And true to form, the second son was born to his other wife, Abigail, and he was named Kilav, which means the father prevails. Next was the infamous Av Shalom, meaning the father is peace, who was born to Ma'aka, a Geshurite woman, meaning she was a foreigner. She was not a Hebrew. Now let me pause to remind you that the kingdom of Geshur was currently under King Ishbosheth's influence, and Geshur was prominent in Abner's step by step plan to reestablish Saul's kingdom for Ishbosheth. So here we see David marry this woman for obvious political reasons to establish a political and a family bond with Gesher in order to outmaneuver Ishbosheth. This is why we are told that daughter that, that Maaka was the daughter of the king of Gesher. Next born was Adonia, God is Lord, and then Shephatiah, which means God is judge. And finally, Yitream, and there's no real assurance of just what that name means, so I'm not even going to guess at it. And we're told that Yitriam was born to Egla, David's wife. So while we can't be certain, it is likely that some of these women mentioned were wives, others of them were just concubines. Those who were official wives were so for the purpose of creating political alliances. The concubines may have been personal handmaidens of some of these wives, or simply women David found especially appealing to him, or probably a combination of both. In any case, constructing a harem was a Middle Eastern custom. It was expected, David, if he was going to have proper status as a king. And while having a harem doesn't necessarily violate the letter of the Torah law, it sure violates the spirit of it. Now let me also point out that while each mother is associated to a specific son for David, this in no way means that this is the only child that each one of these women produced. Each woman would have bore several children. It's only that the, those listed were the firstborns, meaning the first male born to each of these mothers. And understand that this also means that David would have had a lot of children in a very short time, and several would have been around the same age. And that's important, because this is going to play quite a role in some of the antics we see in later chapters about David's unruly family, much of it revolving around jealousy and family power struggles. Well, verse 6 explains that as hostilities, as the hostilities continued, Saul's house was weakening, and thus the already powerful Abner, military commander, gained even more control in Ishbosheth's administration. And in a show of his absolute power, that it was greater than that of the king, his king, Ishbosheth, 
we get a brief story about Abner having a sexual relationship with a concubine from Saul's harem that, of course, had been inherited by his son Ishbosheth. See, it was standard. When a king died or he was deposed, his harem would become the property of the next king. Ritzpa was this woman, and she was a prominent woman, and she played a prominent role in the harem. In fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, we'll read about her some more as concerns the story of the Gibeonites' revenge against the house of Saul. No doubt it was her visibility and her status that's why, of all the women in Saul's old harem, that Abner went after Ritzpah. was to make a point. And this thing that Abner did was really serious. For a, a, a person to indulge himself in the king's exclusive harem, especially with a woman of Ritzpah's status, well, that was an overclaim to power. Everybody understood that. Recall that Jacob's son, Reuben, did essentially the same thing by having sex with Jacob's concubine, Bilah. And the result was that Jacob removed the firstborn status and inheritance rights from Reuben. And by the taking of Bilah, Reuben essentially announced he was taking control of Jacob's family. This was treason. That's why Jacob reacted so harshly. Now, Abner was letting everyone know unequivocally he might not hold the title of king, but it was he, not Ishbosheth, who was the real and unassailable, unassailable power of the Israelite northern tribes. So, when at the royal court, Ishbosheth called out Abner publicly, for doing his dirty deed, Abner became enraged, and he literally shouted at the king. That's something that's just not done, not if you want to keep your head. And our complete Jewish Bible and many other Bible versions say Abner screamed, What am I, the head of a dog of Judah? And even though we can kind of get the gist of this, that we get it that Abner's pretty deeply insulted, much of the phrase doesn't even exist in the original. It does speak of Abner saying, what am I, the head of a dog, but there's nothing at all in it about Judah. It does speak of Abner saying, what am I, the head of a dog? In Hebrew, Abner asks if he's a rosh kelev, and that's a very unusual epithet in the Bible. So some early translators thought that it was an error, and it should have said, Rosh Kalev, Caleb. And since Caleb was a prominent clan within the tribe of Judah, they kind of twisted it all around to come up with head of a dog of Judah. Now we're often going to see this derogatory term the, uh, of a dog in the Bible. And the best way to understand its intent is to understand it that in the eyes of the Middle Easterners of Hebrews of that era, a dog was the opposite of a lion. It was the other end of the scale. A lion was a regal, strong, proud animal that was to be feared. All of these being good attributes. But a dog, unclean, weak, worthless, fit for nothing but to roam the streets and eat garbage. It's all bad attributes. So dog also became a common term applied to a homosexual male in that era, which was one of the greatest taboos for the Hebrews and for most Middle Eastern cultures. In any case, Abner went on to say that he had shown Saul and his house only chesed, the greatest unmerited kindness and grace, at least in his eyes, by allowing Saul's son Ishbosheth to become the king. I mean, what, what an amazing put-down. But then Abner goes on to make an even more amazing confession. He knew, as many knew, that the Lord intended David to be king over all Israel. 
In verse 9, Abner speaks of knowing that Yehovah made some well-known pronouncement that David was his divine choice as king over both Israel and Judah. And all the territory from Dan, who was now residing at the foot of Mount Hermon, all the way south to Beersheba and the southern Negev, that was to be under David. And further, that Abner says that now he intends to give David Ishbosheth's king, uh, kingdom. And Ishbosheth was so intimidated that he didn't utter a word in response. He knew full well that Abner was absolutely able to do everything that he had threatened. There was nothing he could do about it. Now we're going to see other references in this and later chapters to people being aware of the Lord's decree that David was to be king over all Israel. However, we don't find such a decree made public or one even made directly to David in the Bible. So it's probable that for some reason this divine decree was announced by, by Gad, Prophet Gad, or maybe by Samuel and written in a document that, although it was well known in that era, it's become lost to history, kind of like the book of Jasher. And we see that Abner was aware of it. Ishbosheth was aware of it. And it was apparently common knowledge among the people, or at least the elders, of both Judah and Israel. So why wasn't David immediately installed as king when Saul died? Because people don't always do what God wants them to do. We have our own goals. We have our own agendas, our own schedules. And sometimes the Lord's ways and his timing are kind of a fly in our ointment. You irrationally think we can postpone the inevitable. Or maybe we can even advance his schedule. Or that the Lord will look the other way and kind of make an exception for us. Everyone who had the ability to install David as king seemed to know about this divine so they all bore guilt for not fulfilling it immediately. On the other hand, David, who of course knew about it as well, sensed that he was not to take extreme measures to put himself into power, even though the Lord had ordained it. Rather, David figured that if the Lord order, ordained it, the Lord would accomplish it. And it is this Attitude that was one of the several of David's characteristics that, even though it wasn't always present in David, nonetheless it endeared him to the Father. Now, this is not a biblical principle that essentially demands our passivity, where God's will has been made known to us. That is, we don't just pray and then sit on those same prayerful hands wait for God to move in our lives. David was anything but a passive man. Heaven may be our future, but earth is where we are now. And on this physical earth, action is required of us. If David was going to be king, much was going to have to be lined up and readied for him to rule. And since King Saul wanted him dead, the first thing he had to do was somehow remain alive. He had to survive. So David moved around to survive. And he made alliances and he built coalitions and he severed some relationships and he learned the art of warfare and he taught it to his army and he brokered treaties and he gained the favor of powerful men who supported him and he ruled fairly and steadfastly over a relatively small group in his charge and this was all in preparation for him to become king. But he never took the step of deposing the current king or killing the king to take his place. How that throne finally became vacant and all the circumstances came together that finally sat him on that throne were in the Lord's providence. So the principle David demonstrates for us is this. Wow, this is a big one. Pray. 
actively prepare, be still, and be available. And then boldly step across that threshold and God opens the door. So simple, so hard to do. And in verse 12, Abner wastes no time in carrying out the vow that he made against himself, that if he failed to act to install David as king of the north, the Lord ought to do terrible things to him. And he sends emissaries to David to see if the king of Judah is open to a treaty. And David responds that he will be Abner's ally, but on one condition, that his wife, Michal, is returned to him. And David uses a phrase that was rather standard for the Middle East for that time, but has a wonderful and I, I think certain intended parallel to something David's greatest descendant would say a thousand years later. The phrase is, you will not see my face until. And then he goes on to precondition receiving Abner's overture by saying, Michal, his wife, has to be returned to him. Face is panim in Hebrew, panim, and it means presence. It's a term that those in authority and who are royalty use a lot. And here David is saying he will not allow Abner into David's royal presence before his face without this great wrong that was done to him by Saul being righted by Saul's successor. Now listen to this interesting parallel that David's greatest descendant, Messiah Yeshua, was mouthed, and it's recorded in the book of Matthew, in chapter 23, verses 37 through 39. He says this, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, you kill the prophets. You stone those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children just as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you refuse. Look, God is abandoning your house to you, leaving it desolate. For I tell you from now on, you will not see my face until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. David was coming as Israel's king in God's name, ordained, set in place by God. Jesus Christ was coming as Israel's king in God's name, ordained, and set in place by God. David wanted his bride returned to him by the representatives of Saul, the anti-king who is holding her hostage. Yeshua wants his bride, all of redeemed Israel, to, re to be returned to him after they've been held hostage by so long by the representatives of Satan, the Antichrist. David would not accept peace with his brethren, he said, until his bride was returned as a show of good faith. Yeshua will not accept peace with his brethren until his bride is returned. This is a show of good faith. Patterns. It's all about patterns. There is the key of patterns that unlocks so many Bible mysteries that really were not meant to be so difficult or, or, or contentious for us if we'll just see the patterns. And yet, since in David's case, even though a show of good faith is the primary issue, just as it is for Yeshua, by the way, David is, after all, an earthly king. And so, the ways of the flesh are necessarily involved. Getting Michal back solved an interesting political problem. Recall that David did not divorce her. Rather, the anti-king, Saul, forcibly took her and gave her to another man. In David's eyes, although there was certainly a forced separation, Michal indeed was given to somebody else, Michal was still legitimately his bride in his eyes. 
Getting Michal back would serve the practical purpose of making David once again part of Saul's house, part of Saul's family and dynasty through marriage. This, of course, was the whole point when Saul took Michal away from David so that David was no longer King Saul's son-in-law with all the rights associated with that status and position. By being legally bonded to Saul's family through Michal, David would only add to the legitimacy, at least by earthly custom, of having a right to the throne of Saul's old kingdom as his successor. Thus we read that David demanded Ishbosheth as the sitting king to return her to him. And he complied, without doubt, because Abner told him to. And we see McCall's husband, Baltiel, following her until he can go no further, weeping uncontrollably over her loss. Did he really love her that much? Maybe. But Faulty Ella also just lost his connection to Saul's family. That David's gaining back. So there's a lot of elements in play here. The rabbis have had some interesting debates about this very incident. And it centers on whether or not David violated the Torah law by marrying a woman who was already married. After all, Faltiel didn't divorce Michal. She was merely delivered back to David in whatever her current condition was. <coughs> There's no way, after all this time, that Michal wasn't having sexual relations with Faltiel. Certainly some sort of ter- uh, ceremony had to have taken place for it to be a marriage. But in the end, neither had there ever been a divorce. By David. Basically, McCall and David were still married. David, if you'll remember, had paid the bride price. And it is salient that no mention is ever made of a betrothal and a payment by Faltiel, the King Saul, for his daughter Michal. The betrothal ceremony had occurred and consummation was accomplished. That she was removed from David and given to another man was really more akin to kidnapping. Although it certainly wouldn't have been termed that way in that era. Now, had she refused to come back to David, now that's another issue. The law would not have forced her return. And there is no hint that she did not want to come back to King David. Well, now that Abner has made the overture of peace to the king of Judah and shown good faith, by arranging for Michal to be returned to him, Abner has to lay some groundwork. By talking with the various tribal leaders pardon me, of the north to see where they stand on the issue of David becoming their king, and for the reluctant ones, finding a means to try to win their approval. So in verse 17, we have Abner saying to the various leaders of Israel, in the past, You wanted David to be king over you, so now let's do it. But this translation misses the emphasis. What is usually translated as in the past is in Hebrew, temol shoshom. And literally it means yesterday and the day before. But here the phrase is gom temol, gom shoshom. And it means time and again yesterday and the day before, in our Western way of speaking, over and over again you asked for him. Over and over again you wanted this. So the idea is, the northern tribes had been constantly complaining into Abner's ear for some time they wanted David as their king, probably well before Saul died. Certainly before Ishbosheth was appointed king by Abner. And Abner says, well, the opportunity is finally here, so let's do it. And once again, Abner quotes some commonly known prophetic decree about David becoming king, and then he goes to talk with the people of Benjamin. Though little is said, probably no one else but Abner, who was a Benjamite, could have convinced the elders of Benjamin to at least not openly oppose David. I mean, after all, the throne 
had belonged to the tribe of Benjamin up to now. And there was much benefit and status that was associated with that. For Benjamin to peacefully, voluntarily turn the kingdom over to David of the tribe of Judah, especially when Judah had never supported their man, Saul, still didn't support his son Ishbosheth. Well, that would have been an awfully bitter pill to swallow. But with his political ducks in a row now, Abner returns to David with a contingent of men to deliver to David the throne of Israel. A state dinner was held to celebrate the event and seal the deal. And with the agreement complete, all that was left was for Abner to return to the northern territories, assemble the recognized leaders who could speak for each tribe, so that a formal covenant could be cut to unify their leadership now for all 12 tribes under one king for the first time in Israel's history. David did Abner farewell and he guaranteed him safe passage home. After all, it was a very delicate time. Not everybody was going to be so pleased with this momentous new arrangement despite the fact that Jehovah had decreed it, despite the fact that everybody seemed to be aware of it. We'll examine, examine the tragic aftermath of this, this meeting the next time we meet. So please rise.